Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, welcome to the uh, NHGRI Intramural Research Program Research Seminar Series today. I should uh, tell you that this is being broadcast via a Zoom webinar, and uh, during this presentation, you can ask for questions by going online to the uh, Zoom Q&A part, and uh, Dr. Malikdan will be conveying some of those questions at the end for us to give to Dr. Vernig. And uh, you see on the screen that Dr. Vernig is going to be talking about next generation cell therapies for the brain. My name is Dr. Gall. I'm a senior investigator here in NHGRI. And I thought I should just tell you a little bit about our welcome guest today. Uh, Dr. Vernig did physics in graduate school. So that's good background. Congratulations on that. <laughs> and then went to medical school at uh, the Medical University of Vienna. He did his um, graduate school work in physics at Vienna as well. Then he did a residency in neuropathology and general pathology at the University of Bonn, and uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Rudy Janish at the Whitehead I Institute. Then uh, went to Stanford in uh, 2008 as an assistant professor, became an associate professor in 2014, and a full professor in 2019 in the Department of Pathology and the Institute for Stem Cell Biology, which he is currently the co-director of um, at Stanford. Dr. Wernig has garnered many different awards. I'm just going to mention a, a, a few of them. <clears throat> the Quattarelli Prize for Outstanding Scientific Excellence by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. The Asina Award from the Ministry of Science and Research in the Republic of Austria, the New York Stem Cell Foundation Robertson Stem Cell Prize, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Faculty Scholar Award. And there are others on here I, I haven't uh, really mentioned. He's published over 130 articles uh, and reviews, and many of them are in uh, nature journals, and uh, some of them are in science translational medicine, and cell, and PNAS, and development really uh, good journals. He's delivered over 150 invi uh, invited lectures uh, around the world, and he's uh, extremely well-funded. And you'll see what an expert he is um, in this field. So I'm going to now uh, pass the podium on to um, Dr. Wernig. Wernig, and uh, his talk is Next Generation Cell Therapies for the Brain. So take it away, sir. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. Um, um, these long lists of um, awards and so forth just means I'm getting older and older. That's not, not much. <laughs> That's what happens when you're a scientist and in the business for a while. <laughs> but of course, it's great to be a scientist. And I hope I can um, share with you a little bit of uh, our excitement and what, um, you know, what uh, gets up, up at, uh, in the morning every day to, um, to work on. Um, as probably many of you know, um, the concept of embryonic development and cell differentiation is really much governed by the epigenetic um, mechanisms that people have in mind. So beautifully illustrated by Conrad Waddington in the 1950s with this landscape where, where balls run down um, um, you know, valleys and once um, a ball has found its valley, um, uh, then you, there's no way to go back anymore, right? However, there's an alternative um, possibility that people have come up with, uh, thought maybe cell lineage specification is really rather dictated by a specific set of transcription factors, which I've tried to illustrate with these, um, with these, with these letters. And uh, the idea was that if you uh, just knew the identity of the key lineage determination factors, such as ABC, you know, for pluripotent cells all, all the way uh, in, in, on top of this, this landscape here, then you should be able to really reprogram the cells um, um, into any direction uh, that you like. So as, as you uh, probably know, uh, this, uh, these type of experiments worked and uh, led to the discovery of iPS cells, uh, which uh, was rewarded with a Nobel Prize in 2010, I believe, to Shina Yamanaka. And our contribution to, to this field was that we wanted to extend this idea and ask whether this reprogramming also works between two somatic lineages that are really distantly uh, uh, 
only distantly related. And we were actually able to convert uh, fire blasts directly into cells that really um, looked and behaved like neurons, so we called them in analogy to, to iPS cells, induced neuronal cells. And, we've, <clears throat> and we found these th three transcription factors, A is the one with one like and brain two, to do that uh, job. And these cells remarkably not only look like neurons, they actually had all the functional properties that you would like to see from, from a neuron. Namely, they were able to fire action potentials and form functional synapses when we were co culturing together. We are very fortunate to work with Tom Sudhoff, an expert in, uh, uh, in synaptic biology and neuroscientist who helped us characterize these cells. So uh, ever since, people got uh, very excited about this idea because it really suggested that maybe everything is possible and if you just knew the right factors, you really should be able to move cells along the entire you know, um, um, uh, developmental potential room, right, uh, into, into every corner. Um, and there is a lot of examples. This is uh, an image from, from a review we wrote several years ago, and uh, it's already way outdated. There's a lot of um, amazing um, examples out there now where you can actually really use this transcription factor um, based approach to program cells into a, into a specific lineage of your a desire. And we have um, really worked uh, over the years to generate neurons from also different cell types, from different donor cell types, always with the same goal in mind to generate neurons. And we were actually were also able to um, reprogram uh, even um, endodermal cells from a completely different uh, germ lineage, hepatocytes, um, as well as, which I'm quite proud of, um, lymphocytes, which to me is really one of the um, most differentiated uh, sort of uh, specialized cell in the, in the body that you can think of, you know, some, some small round cell that floats around in our blood, right? Even that uh, we could manage to reprogram to, uh, to neurons. I just wanted to show you some pictures how, how uh, we can slowly but surely morph these round cells over several weeks to these beautifully looking uh, neurons that, that have these nice dendritic arborizations. Um, we uh, got help with some small molecules in addition to the transcription factors that improved the reprogramming efficiency quite well. And even those uh, lymphocyte, adult human lymphocyte derived induced neural cells or, or N cells were able to um, receive synaptic input from, from primary neurons. So they were also functional um, based on electrophysiological recordings. Um, I briefly showed this already earlier, but we also um, explored what these transcription factors would do to pluripotent cells themselves. Um, we actually started out using those more like as a positive control because a pluripotent cell is poised to differentiate. So you would assume if you um, add a transcription factor to, to, to their portfolio, it would have even stronger effects than a somatic cell would have. And that worked uh, much better than we had even thought it would. And we found that actually the single transcription factor engine two, um, and uh, many people actually around the globe are using this transcription factor now to just generate neurons from ES or, or IPS cells because it really produces this very homogeneously looking population of, of it seems like pure neurons um, that, uh, that also develop in, in very rapid uh, time, like of a time frame of two to three weeks. Uh, these beautiful synapses that you can see here stained um, with, with these red dots here, uh, synapsin. And uh, when we do patch clamp recordings, they are beautifully functional, have synapses, and importantly, they, have uh, they are ex exclusively excitatory, so they only use the neurotransmitter glutamate. Um, we explored them a little uh, more in more detail by doing a single cell sequencing, RNA sequencing analysis, and what we noticed um, quite early on, actually already, is that compared to undifferentiated cells, uh, these uh, mature, you know, synapse forming um, NGN2 cells derived from pluripotent cells are quite heterogeneous. Even though from a morphological point of view and from a functional point of view, they are homogeneous, they're all excitatory neurons. But from a transcription point of view, there is quite some spread on this single cell um, Tisney plot, as you can see. 
So when we looked a little bit closer how to explain this, obviously they were all neurons, so they expressed panneural markers, and they were all excitatory, which or, or expressed excitatory markers such as VGLUT1 and VGLUT2, which is uh, exactly what we had seen from our functional characterization. But when you look at other, other neurotransmitter uh, markers, such as cholinergic markers, we saw some of them being at least partially induced, and it seemed to explain these different populations. So in particular, this population down here uh, expresses uh, you know, this choline transporter, as well as the vesicular acetylcholine transporter, and, um, and some portion of this upper cluster is positive for these genes as well. And when we then look at uh, transcription factors that are sort of associated with this cholinergic program, we noticed islet 1, um, as well as FOX2B and FOX2A, which I don't show here, uh, quite nicely also um, characterize these, these, uh, these, these clusters. And it seems we have, like, based on these transcription factors, we have really three groups. They are all excitatory, but one group co-expresses islet 1 and, and FOX2B, which is this cluster down here. Um, and another group expresses only islet 1, but is negative for FOX2B. And then there is a, a set which is negative for both of these, uh, these transcription factors. So we have to sort of um, try to you know, illustrate these three populations over there. So it became quite clear that even though we, um, uh, for, so from this function perspective, we thought they were homogeneous, but when you look more deeper in the, tr in the transcriptional um, a response or tr tr uh, through transcriptional characterization. There are actually some heterogeneity, and in particular, we saw cholinergic as well as other neurotransmitter programs being somewhat partly, um, partially uh, induced in at least some subpopulations of, of these cells. And that, by the way, in itself is an interesting finding, we think, and we still don't really understand the, uh, the answer because we start with a very homogeneous population of ES cells and put just a single transcription transcription factor into these cells, and we select for the expression of this uh, factor. So there's, there's, there's not much uh, variability in the expression levels, really. And still, we have a reproducible um, sort of heter th three population outcome. Right? How this mechanistically uh, works is, is still a mystery to us. So we next asked whether these transcription factors that we used as, as labels right, for these different clusters actually also play functional roles, and uh, just added those in combination with, with NGN2 to, the, to, to these cultures. And um, they all made uh, beautiful neurons, somewhat differently looking though. And when we uh, then look for these uh, couple key cholinergic uh, sort of reporter genes again, we actually did see that both islet 1 and FOX2B and uh, to some degree also in, in their combination were actually responsible for this, for this cholinergic program. So it seemed that these are true key transcription factors that are mediating um, this, this sort of um, um, other neurotransmitter phenotype that, that causes some heterogeneity. And of course, um, one goal was to make this protocol even more homogeneous and maybe try to eliminate these, these subpopulations that would co-induce such a cholinergic program. And we thought of two approaches. The first um, approach we thought of was um, ES cells are super plastic and they're quite easily to, um, moved and patterned in, um, in various neural progenitor cells. It's particularly straightforward to differentiate them in primitive neural ectodermal cells that can then be patterned with wind or without wind into an anterior or a posterior population. And we thought, let's pre-specify, so to say, these neural cells first and then add our NG2 transcription factor because we know NG2, this famous pro-neural BHLH transcription factor, is very good at just turning everything into neurons. And if we have a pre-specified perhaps we can limit the developmental potential uh, first and then just induce the neuronal differentiation with the transcription factor. So that's what we did. And um, the, the, uh, was quite remarkable that this patterning, for, for one, worked really well, but it actually was maintained throughout the differentiation. So let me quickly guide you through this principal component plot here. Um, so here you have... Um, um, the three different populations, undifferentiated, um, H9 ES cells, um, the uh, anterior and the posteriorized neuroectoderm cells that were uh, exposed to NGN2 for either two days, uh, so very early in these light colors, and in these open circles uh, um, for 28 days, so for, for a long time. So those are the really mature uh, functional neurons here. And what, what was really striking is that um, we see a difference, right? This principal component two really 
um, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, dominating the difference between these three different donor cells, if you, if you want, and that is maintained beautifully throughout the differentiation protocol. So the, the patterning works, and then the differentiation that is mediated by NGN2 doesn't really change much of, the, uh, of, of this original you know, uh, differential patterning right, that, that we have induced into these cells. And on the other hand, their maturation stage, right, which seems to be corresponding to this principle one component here, is also quite similar between those. So it's this um, a very similar uh, maturation stage, and the um, type of patterning is maintained throughout the process. So that already indicated to us that presumably we didn't really uh, achieve our goal here, right? Because what we actually wanted is to um, end up with a more homogeneous uh, cell population, right? In the end of our, you know, this, this four week old um, uh, end cells. But we probably uh, only have accomplished is we have sort of um, still maintained the original patterning that we have induced in, in, into the cells, right? So that was, that was, um, uh, the, the initial conclusion for this, and, but it was um, more solidified when we then looked at the specific genes that are you know, underlying these, uh, these principal component plots. And just as sanity checks, you know, when you look for um, uh, posterior genes like Hox genes, they are beautifully induced right, in these in this posterior populations, um, and anterior genes like uh, OTX genes are beautifully highly expressed in anterior populations and repressed in, 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 in the posterior populations. So it's, it, this patterning worked exactly as advertised. And, but importantly, it's uh, um, really kept through the differentiation because, uh, in fact, all of this data plotted here are from this 28-day-old um, uh, cells, which are the mat mature neurons. But um, unfortunately, as we had already sort of concluded from the principal component uh, analysis, uh, we have not really accomplished our goal. So as you can see, islet one is in fact uh, repressed in this posterior population, um, but it is really not affected at all in this anterior po population indicated in, in, in the red color here, uh, compared to the non padded population in blue. So we do see, see some effect, but it actually was the exact opposite of what we had expected because, um, you know, there's a f motor neurons are famous uh, cholinergic neurons in the spinal cord. So if anything, we probably would have expected that cholinergic problem should be rather induced in the posterior component as, as opposed to the, to the anterior uh, component. And when we look at the um, uh, sort of marker genes for a, a variety of uh, neurotransmitters subspecification -spe -spe markers, we see that there's really not much change, right? We, we, I mean, there is change, uh, but, but not, there's not um, a significant, obvious suppression of the resulting neurons. So uh, we are also interested in, in, in mechanisms and um, asked where is the transcription factor actually landing in these different um, cell populations, right? The patterning into anterior and posterior population also changes the epigenetic landscape. And transcription factors are thought to be quite um, dictated, right, in their ability to access the, the genome by the chromatin, by open and closed chromatin, where these transcription factors can, can go. And um, what we actually saw is that the NGN2 distribution throughout the genome is actually not all that much changed uh, in these different combinations, in, in, in these different cell populations. So here again are the, the ES cells, the anterior and the posterior populations, and here a chip sequencing experiment pulling out all the sites where NGN2 is bound. And you see that, I mean, that there are some sites that might be lost, but there is certainly no um, sites that are newly gained for, for NGN2. So overall, a quite similar um, pattern. And in blue, you see uh, an attack seek um, signal, which is a measurement um, to measure the accessibility, or the openness, so to say, of the chromatin. And there's a, typically a very good correlation between where NGN2 binds and where a chromatin is open. So uh, overall, not so much happening there on, on, that, on that front. What we did make, um, or the and, and, and surprising observation we made, is that um, actually in this context, NGN2 we found to be directly um, bound at the islet one promoter sites, as well as um, one of the, at least one of the cholinergic genes, 
uh, presumably directly um, regulating such a cholinergic program, which doesn't make too much sense actually, because NGN2 is expressed in a variety of different, uh, you know, neural precursor cells and are responsible for the differentiation of of, of many uh, different types of of neurons. Certainly not a specific cholinergic inducer. So that is interesting that in this particular context of an ES cell, NGN2 would would do that. So since our first approach didn't really pan out as we had uh, hoped, we um, came back to um, you know, our love to transcription factors to begin with and thought, why not um, you know, combine transcription factors right from the start? It also makes things easier. You don't have to worry about you know, media exchanges and, and variability, how, how efficient cells differentiate along a different path. And just start with the undifferentiated cells and uh, partner engine 2 with other transcription factors, which, by the way, this is, not, this is nothing new, right? Developmental biologists such as Francois Guimot have already you know, discovered many uh, transcription factors that are thought to be responsible more for subspecification, right? That's really not a long stretch. And we should have thought of this um, uh, much earlier because uh, even earlier we um, actually were very successful to generate pure cultures of inhibitory neurons, GABAergic neurons, by combining another BHLH transcription factor uh, called um, AACL1 with such a homeobox factor which is more restricted and thought to be more instructive for a sub-lineage for the GABAergic lineage. And that worked really, really well. So we assume AACL1 is really uh, there to, to induce a, a sort of a pan-neuronal differentiation program, and DLX2 is job is really to sub, you know, specify uh, the lineage and produce these beautiful um, cultures of purely inhibitory neurons. So um, back to our problem to sort of get rid of this uh, cholinergic program in our NGN2 cells, which are otherwise excitatory, and thought, like, what transcription factors could potentially do uh, the job? And we, since we wanted to generate a cortical, sort of forebrain-type neurons, we uh, picked some transcription factors uh, that um, are good candidates for that. And uh, there's this class of homeobox transcription factors, EMX1 and 2, as well as OTX1 and 2, that are beautifully expressed in, in, uh, in, in this uh, sort of... Um, extended pattern um, starting from the, from the um, very anterior tip of the telencephal and going all the way um, at the, at the um, midbrain, hindbrain boundary. And we also included FOXG1, which is expressed um, about similarly as AMX2 from, uh, from the middle of the di diencephalon. And when we combine these transcription factors as two factor combinations with NGN2, and then do an RNA sequencing characterization of these cells, we actually very, um, you know, um, we are very relieved to see that we actually generate a very different set of uh, different neuronal populations. So it's actually kind of cool, you know, with a different combination of transcription factors, you can really send the, the cells in sort of different um, lineages of, of neurons. And, and th those are all neurons, right, by, by, by functional as well as by a sort of morphological criteria, but they obviously have a very different um, RNA sequencing um, pattern. But our main goal was to see whether we can sort of purify the population, right, and, and, and hone in the, the, the glutaminergic program and rather repress all the other uh, programs. So we looked specifically at that. And we were very pleased to see that in particular the um, EMX genes and FOXG1 uh, FOX was very efficient to, uh, to block islet one as well as this FOX2B transcription factor, which we thought are really the, sort of the key nodes right, responsible for, for uh, cholinergic programs. So they were really good at that, and also quite good at uh, repressing um, choline acetyl transferase, which is another marker, as well as this vesicular uh, marker. And when we then plot more um, of these uh, lineage uh, uh, indicators, these lineage marker genes here, we actually did uh, see a much better suppression than in our previous um, attempts with the uh, pre, you know, differentiation, so this pre-patterning. Here, in particular, we liked the combination NGN2 and EMX1, which did the best job of uh, of repressing these non-glutaminergic uh, programs. And again, we uh, wanted to uh, see, uh, can we explain this on a molecular level? And in quite contrast to what I've shown you previously, where NGN2 is bound in these pre pattern cells, now when we add EMX1 or um, FOXG1, now we see a very different binding pattern of, of NGN2. So that the partnering of, of homeobox factors or this 4 uh, uh, factor, FOXG1, um, has a much stronger effect 
on how Engine 2 can access and does actually access the, the, the chromatin. And now we actually have quite a substantial um, set of loci where um, um, the binding of Engine 2 is not only lost, as in the previous example, but also really gained. And uh, for Fox, uh, Fox J1, we couldn't do the experiment, but for, for Emacs 1, we were able to, um, to find good um, uh, good uh, uh, antibodies, and actually in this case used, used a flag tag to do that, and asked where is e um, EMX1 going, and the quality, as you can see, is not quite as good as for the engine 2 but still, we saw, um, I think I've circled this here, um, for those sites that are where engine 2 is gaining new access to the, to the chromatin, we actually see a quite clear enrichment also of EMX1, suggesting that EMX1 may actually drag engine 2 to, this, to these new sites. And to um, uh, investigate this also for the, for the uh, Fox chip one sites where we couldn't really do the chip seek experiment, but we could look for the, uh, for the motifs behind it, right? That was also actually quite striking um, uh, where we look, when, when we look for the uh, uh, sites where Engine 2 is bound exclusively in the presence of, of uh, Fox chip one we see a, a clear enrichment of the Fox chip one motif Presumably, Fox J1 would also be binding there. And the same is, of course, also true for, um, for the sites that are newly bound by Engine 2, dependent on EMX1. We see a nice EMX1 motif uh, being enriched there. And for that case, we also know that EMX, EMX1 protein itself is, is present there as well. So a lot more um, protein protein interaction, actually, than we had in, um, Im imagined uh, before. Uh, a little bit closer look at uh, EMX1 itself, it seems it, that to be rather um, have a, a transcriptional repressive role than an activating role. When we um, look at the overall gene expression, so plot the sort of average gene expression um, globally as well as uh, the, um, the EMX4 target genes, they're much more they're significantly repressed rather than induced. And when we look at the uh, differentially regulated genes, and do a GO term analysis, um, the genes that are in fact uh, repressed by EMX1 um, have you know, GO terms that are associated with, with several neuronal specification um, uh, programs that are not excitatory, right? You see spinal cord and, and, and um, sympathetic neuron and, and, and so forth, cranial neuroformation and, and so forth. So things um, make, make a lot of sense. All right. I am um, now uh, pretty much at the uh, half of my time, which is a perfect timing because I would like to change some gears now and tell you um, a little bit more about our bit more translational efforts, um, how to really go about sort of new types of, of therapies. I know this is really a little bit of a pipe dream. Um, you know, people in particular, we had uh, over lunch with the students discussed this a little, uh, uh, in particular investors are very scared of cell therapies in general, very complicated, you know, manufacturing and so forth. But we think as academics, we have the freedom to, you know, uh, pave new ground and, and try things out without the pressure of, of having to make money, right? We, um, I always say uh, my job is to burn money and gain knowledge and uh, whereas investor has to make money. Right, so, so luckily we are in this luxury uh, position. And throughout my um, you know, scientific career, I've really thought, you know, how can we get the like, cell therapy to work in the brain? This is taken from one of my papers that I did uh, with Rudolf Jenisch as a postdoc, which by the way, um, yielded this Cozzarelli Prize from the National Academy of Sciences. So that's, <laughs> thanks for mentioning this. Uh, this by the way was also a very nice trip to Washington, I remember. Probably not too far from it. No, it was at the mall. Uh, this, this, the, right, the academy is there. Yeah. Anyway, so um, so this was um, actually one of the first times that um, um, iPS cells were shown to have a therapeutic effect, and we, this is all mouse at this point. This, you see on the data is early on. So we differentiated um, mouse iPS cells at the point to dopaminergic neurons and and showed that it has a therapeutic effect in a rat model of of the disease of of, um, of a Parkinson model of, of rats. But what you also see, um, so th I, should, oh, I should point out that um, this slide is stained for TH. So the, uh, the, the black substance here is, is uh, the transplanted dopamine uh, neurons, presumably. And this is the, the normal side, right? This, this is how um, 
the dopamine neurons normally project into the into the striatum, obviously very homogeneously and you know, throughout the entire brain structure, or this area at least. Whereas our grafted cells, even though they had a beautiful therapeutic effect, they were really um, you know stuck exactly where you put them, and there was really not much migration. And you know, for Parkinson, people pursue this. I mean, there's clinical trials going on now, multiple actually of them. Um, you know, for Parkinson's, it may, may be okay to um, to have that level of, of innovation, this local you know problem, and at least for the motoric symptoms, you, you, you may have a good benefit. But it's still really not satisfactory from a more general point of view. We really would like to have something that has you know better incorporation pattern in, into the brain, and there's at least some migration. Um, so I just take this this as an example of you know. Well, Many of my, during, during my training, as well as in my own lab, attempts to you know, get some ther cell therapy really to work. Right? So at some point, um, we thought about microglia. Um, those are hematopic cells. They're not you know, the cells that usually come to our mind that we would want to replace, or you know, they're not degenerating uh, in, in, in diseases and so forth. Um, but they're still important, uh, those brain cell types. And, there, are, there is this body of literature that claims that when you do a bone marrow transplantation, that some cells can get into the brain. At that point, when we started this work, about five years ago or so, um, it was not that clear how robust this is. Um, there was even some, some you know, old literature from the like, 80s um, that even in human, right, in, uh, in, in um, Y chromosome, mismatched donor samples, they would see some Y chromosome positive cells in the brain. So it was really exciting. And, but even in mice, at that point, it was not so clear, at least to us, you know, how robust is this phenomenon. Um, so we wanted just to re repeat this in our own, in our own hands. And uh, Yohei Shibuya, the postdoc who started all this work, just did a conventional bone marrow transplantation. We used uh, busulfan um, also in mice because that is what mostly is done in the, in the clinic in, in, in people. Injected bone marrow into these uh, into these mice, and then just uh, followed these mice and looked in the in the peripheral blood as well as in the brain, uh, what happens to this GFP labeled cells. And as of course expected, there was a very high rapid chimerism being formed in the peripheral blood, and somewhat uh, intriguingly. Um, there was also a chimerism formed in, in the brain, which is actually quite substantial, you know, on, on average maybe 40% or so. But it was, there was a, a long delay. So at this early time point of, let's say, four weeks, where essentially the entire blood is already GFP positive, there's really not much yet going on in the, in the brain. It takes another good, uh, you know, two months before anything really shows up in the brain. So that's one thing. You know, why is this, this delay? Why, what are the, why do, do, does it so, take so much time for the cells to find you know, the way from the circulation into the brain? But the second um, issue was that, yes, we, we on average got a relatively you know, nice chimerism, 40% is, is substantial, but it really was highly variable. And this is from this, you know, the same batch of cells, of course different mice, but the same hands, you know, the same postdoc injecting exactly the same way and, and highly variable uh, results that didn't really uh, sort of hone in into, 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 into a less variability situation after longer time points. So sometimes we would get like beautiful uh, uh, chimerism in these in this, in this brains, but sometimes really, uh, you know, it's hard to find any cell. So not really something, um, Good to work with. So we thought there's really room for improvement, and read more papers, and stumbled upon this what what uh, you know I, I would like to call the microglial niche conundrum, because there there are some experimental conditions where apparently it's very easy for circulation derived cells, for peripheral blood cells, to get into the brain, and there's other conditions where it all seems almost impossible for these cells to enter the brain. And um, one example, which I'm shown here from, from, from as just as an example, but there's many papers like that from Bennett et al. 2018, where he took a CSF1 receptor knockout mouse. So I should point out that CSF1 receptor is a key signaling pathway for microglial survival. So without that receptor, without that intact signaling pathway, microglia cannot survive. So when you knock out that receptor, these, these mice don't have any microglia in their brains. And when, in, when you inject bone marrow, actually just IP into these newborn mice, you, you can see that the entire brain is full of these GFP positive cells. So in that context, the brain is almost like a sponge and you know, takes up you know, all these, these uh, cells from the circulation. 
and, and they become microglia-like cells. If you do a very similar type of experiment and rather block the same pathway pharmacologically than genetically, which, which you can do very well, these, there, there are some, some drugs developed that are super potent and you can and we, 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 uh, we could repro uh, rep re um, <laughs> reproduce this, this data readily. And in like 10 days, you can deplete more than 90% of these cells beautifully. It's a beautiful reagent. Um, so you also deplete microglia. And when you withdraw this drug, you also see a recovery, also a repopulation that's somewhat similar to, to this. But in this case, all the cells that, that, that have repopulated the brain are from within the brain and not from recirculation. And not a single cell has been found to be recruited from recirculation. So you would assume that the same signals are involved, right? Because in both cases, you, um, you have a transient period where the microglia are depleted. So what's going on there? We wanted to simplify things a little bit because you know there's it's quite a complex thing, right? Going from the blood into the brain, there's the blood-brain barrier that needs to be some attachment first, and then once they're on the other side of the of, of the of the vessel, they need to differentiate, right? So we wanted to simplify the situation a little bit and take the blood-brain barrier out of the out of the equation and just put these bone marrow cells right behind the blood-brain barrier, right into the brain. So it's a little bit of a silly experiment, you would think, and some people have done this actually before when, when they were Dreaming of transdifferentiation, some of, of you might remember these times. So we injected bone marrow into the, into the brain. And what happened was, not much. It, what, what did happen is, though, that these cells did, did survive for at least two weeks, but they were hanging out there. They still have round sort of hematopoietic precursor cell morphology. They don't express um, IBO1, which is a microglial marker. So they are I'm not sure what they do there. They are hanging out there, not knowing what to do, and, and that's it. However, when you do the exact same experiment into a mouse brain that was previously depleted for microglia, so into a mouse brain that has no microglia, the situation, the outcome was completely different. First of all, we saw many more cells, and they were much more spread around the injection site, and literally all of these GFP-positive cells that injected bone marrow cells had changed their morphology and had these beautiful ramifications, and all of them expressed IBA1. There were none of these precursor cells, round IBA1 negative cells left. At least everything that was left was, was microglial-like cells. So that experiment told us that these, these niche factors, that, that, that is, that, that these, these niche factors that, that apparently are produced in a microglia-free brain are a very strong, um, environment for hematopoietic cells to adopt a microglia-like um, phenotype. So it's as if the brain would call for help, right? If there's no microglia around, I grab anything that comes around and turn you into a microglia, right? but maybe anything hematopoietic. So we thought, that's great. That seems a really strong signal. Let's take advantage of this. And let's combine this with, a, with the bone marrow transmutation protocol that we had done before. And um, let me just come right to the chase. When we do this, we do first a bone marrow transmutation, and then let the mice recover a little bit, give this Plexicon drug, well, you know, this is a CS1 receptor inhibitor from this company, Plexicon, which, by the way, doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, the drug is still very good. <laughs> um, and then let, let, the, let the, uh, the mice recover from, from that drug, and then analyze these brains. We have a very consistent, you know, over 90% um, GFP positive um, hematopic population based on facts. And I'm a trained neuropathologist, so I always have to do sections and look, you know, how these these dots on the facts plot actually look like. And when you do that, we see the entire brain is full of these transplanted cells. And when you look a little bit more, more in the detail, they look beautiful. And we actually, when we have a good drug and a good depletion, because we had bad batches of the drug, but when we have a good drug, we have really hard times finding an endogenous microglia in this, in this, uh, in this context. So in, uh, I don't see any Micro, I have one positive cell, which is red, that is not GFP positive. And if anybody can spot one, please let me know. I, I, I couldn't. Um, so it's very, very efficient. The entire microglial, at least parenchymal, you know, um, a part of the microglial population is replaced with these grafted cells. So let me just go back to, to this image. How different does that look like than this, this PNS paper I just showed you where we transmitted these dopamine neurons, where the cells were just stuck there exactly where, where we put, right? Now we have access to the entire 
brain. And it turns out also the spinal cord. So the, the, the entire CNS with a relatively simple, already, you know, clinically, uh, you know, uh, almost, you know, the variation, we just did the variation of a clinically, uh, you know, approved procedure. So that, that was really exciting. And of course, one of the first things we asked is, can, you know, is this useful? Can we, um, can we uh, you know, see some therapeutic benefit uh, that, that we can take advantage of the system for some, some, some disease models? And one of the um, things that come to mind are lysosomal storage diseases, and I uh, had the uh, chance to, to talk about that earlier. Um, um, but I don't show this here because it was already published earlier. But um, another thing that also came quite uh, early to mind is I'm sure uh, everybody in this room is aware of this uh, strong um, you know, genetics um, uh, link between um, microglial genes and Alzheimer's disease, in particular TREM2 variants. Um, confer a high, they are relatively rare compared to APOE, but, um, but the, the risk they confer is, 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 I think, on par with the APOE4 a little. Um, so th th there's also a syndrome called nasohacular disease that is the, um, where people are deficient for, for this TREM2, this microglial receptor, uh, which has a, a very rapid um, a neurodegenerative phenotype. So that um, was sort of, you know, screaming at us, literally, right? Uh, we can replace, we can fix the problem, right? We can change the microglia that have the deficient uh, receptor with wild type cells, right? As easy as that. Um, so we got a hold of an uh, Alzheimer's disease model, which is a plaque model. So they express uh, A-beta and, and form these beautiful plaques, which are, um, well, I'm sure they're beautiful from a you know, from a neuropathologist's point of view, uh, not, not for the mouse and not for the patient, of course, but they form these, um, these A-beta plaques. And in a normal mouse, the uh, microglia have a strong reaction to these plaques. So you see in, in black again, the IB-1 stain, you see how these microglia react to them and, and sort of circle around these plaques and you know, try to do something with them. They are not able to quite phagocytose them, but they certainly do something to these plaques and are, are reactive. So when you knock out TREM2 on top of that, these microglia couldn't care less. They seem to be completely insensitive to this pathology, as if they are, you know, blind. They, you know, they, they, so it seems, and that's what I, I guess this, these data are sort of the basis for why people believe that this TREM2 signal is really important, for, you know, for, for measuring disease and, and then responsible for, for a microglia re, um, activation, which is um, apparently beneficial, right? We also had this discussion earlier whether you know, those are bad or good microglia. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that is something um, quite measurable. And uh, we were wondering whether we can you know, use this as a, as a readout to see whether such a cell therapy could, could work. In, in so we did the exact same uh, experiment with, with our transplant cells now on the other hand. So when we take uh, wild type bone marrow cells and replace them in these uh, Alzheimer models, in these plaque models, um, as expected, the, uh, the cells again uh, nicely react to, the, to this plaque. So here's like two, two examples. You, you will notice, and I sort of forgot to point this out, these um, bone marrow derived cells, they're, they're, they're a little different than microglia. So that's why we don't call them, we cannot call them microglia. They, they are different morphologically, as, as you see, they're a little bit more simplified. They, they, they are ramified and they have uh, all the functional properties that, that you want to see. They can phagocytose. They respond uh, to, to inflammatory stimuli with, with secretion of cytokines and so forth, but they do this slightly differently than, 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 um, than real microglia. More, more important to also have the proper control ex experiments um, done here. But importantly, when we um, um, take knockout cells as, as a control, right? So for that reason, this, this is an important control. Also, these bone marrow derived cells are you know, insensitive seemingly, to, to, to these plaques. So um, that is uh, a, a, a great result because we can now, in principle, you know, restore this dysfunctional TREM2 receptor in, at least in this, in this mouse model. And uh, importantly, you know, these, these cells are not uh, activated, but it, um, the, the microglial function apparently has also an effect on the overall plaque load in this model. Um, so with TREM2, typically you have fewer of these, uh, of these plaques, which is sh uh, shown here, right, in the control conditions. TREM2 white type here has fewer plaques as well as, uh, uh, compared to the, to, the, to the knockout. And we see a beautiful, you know, s similar effect or rescue, if you want, uh, of, the, of this particular um, 
um, mutant when we transplant um, the, um, the wild type bone marrow and replace the TRAM2 mutant microglia in these brains with, with these, um, with these um, circulation derived cells. Um, all right, so um, um, I have a lot of uh, um, clinical fellows in, in the lab, so the, the potential applications of this hematopoietic you know, replacement uh, therapy is, is, is quite, quite big. And one of, of my fellows got really interested in neuroinflammatory neuro disease, um, in particular MS, and in particular because um, there is um, evidence that bone marrow transplantation may have a long-lasting beneficial effect on a progressive and a chronic relapsing um, multiple sclerosis. So this is taken from a, from a relatively recent review um, that um, has uh, collected you know, metadata from, from a, I forgot how many patients, but, but quite a lot, as you can, you can see. And um, compared to historical data, is my understanding, that it's quite an impressive finding that uh, after 10 years um, of, of bone marrow transplanted MS patients, uh, you still have a 60% um, uh, um, uh, disease-free or um, relapse-free um, period. And uh, so that particular review also looked at different conditioning. There seems to be some stratification depending on how you do the bone marrow transplantation. Seems to have more or less uh, 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 better effects. But th there seems quite a convincing um, uh, effect on the bone marrow transplantation on that disease. But the mechanisms are completely unclear. I think most people think of T cells and lymphocytes, you know, this is an autoimmune disease and there's, you know, specific antibodies and specific, you know, epitopes that T cells attack on, on myelin and then oligodendrocytes, of course. So I guess the overall idea in this bone marrow transplantation is to rather have a lymph ablation, right, and sort of kill uh, lots, lots of the lymphopoietic system and replace that with a sort of a reset uh, immune system, if, if you will. Um, but nobody thinks so much, I think, about myelin cells. So we thought we have now a, a nice way to assess really the contribution of brain myelin cells, or microglia in particular, um, uh, what the contribution of those cells would be, because we have now this way to really completely um, exchange those cells as well. So that's why we got a hold of, um, of a, um, an EAE model. There's a bunch of them. And we picked on purpose um, a, like the chronic form of, of, of EAE. <clears throat> I should say this is uh, you know, a very common neuroinflammatory model. Um, not, not sure the experts would, would be happy to call it a good MS model, but this is the model that people use and, and, and we have. Um, it stands for experimental autoimmune encephalitis. encephalomyelitis. And uh, also in our hands, we get this to work quite nicely. We see these chronic lesions here. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, a DAPI enrichment of, of cells and so infiltration of of immune cells, including IBOB1, you know, myelin cells, and um, um, a clear demyelination here when they stay, stay in here for uh, fluoromyelin. So the, um, the model is, is really well established and, and was readily um, um, working in, in, in our hands as well. So we uh, did um, a couple cohorts um, of many, many mice with, the, with various different conditions to assess whether this added uh, microglia replacement has any you know, clinical functional effect on the course of the of the disease. So let me quickly walk you through this through this data. Uh, in red, uh, you see the normal course of EAE in this model. So you typically have a very consistent peak of severity, and that then over time um, sort of um, becomes more, more more chronic. It goes down a little bit, but then sort of really stays. up oh, sorry, my stays. Um, um, sort of on, on the same level. Right? There's other models with, which are more chronic relapsing, so they go more in waves, but this is the one which is really more uh, sort of chronic stable. Um, and in uh, the other colors are the various control groups. So first we uh, also, of course, tested whether this, this, this plexicon drug itself may have an effect, because of course, you know, it's quite a big thing to eliminate microglia for like a week or so and then have them come back. That alone could have, could have an effect. But in, you know, this, this seems this transient depletion of plexicon during these 10 days here and didn't really uh, affect the, the course of the disease um, at all. However, the bone marrow transplantation groups did 
So that, that, that is in line you know, with, with, with some papers that have, have, have been done in, um, in rodent models, as well as you know, in some open label clinical studies that I showed that I proposed that bone marrow transplantation may have, may have a benefit. And indeed, uh, conventional bone marrow transplantation, right around the time you know, after the cell transplantation, these curves diverge here, and the, uh, the clinical scores here um, are getting uh, uh, consistently better in these bone marrow transplantation groups. And quite nice to see for us is that when we then add our, our plexicon trick here, which then you know, boosts the microglia replacement, right around the time where you actually expect an effect, which is at the end of this plexicon treatment, we see a further improvement of, the, uh, of this treatment group here. So it seems that the um, replacement of the, of, the, of the myelin cells actually does have a functional effect. And you know, the, the, the difference between gr green and blue line can, cannot be explained with the difference in the lymphoid uh, compartment. <clears throat> so it turns out that um, this chronic phase of EA is actually not that well characterized. Most studies um, uh, like are around here, whereas our you know, cell therapy is, uh, of course, takes some time to, to reach the brain. So we are rather interested in the, in the chronic phase. And so to, to characterize what's, what is going on on the uh, both on the recovery side as well as on the on the molecular side, we uh, wanted to do a single cell experiment, a single cell characterization, single cell RNA sequencing uh, characterization. We actually did a nuclear um, uh, sequencing here, and that experiment actually worked really, really well. So um, I can highly recommend this. It's somewhat expensive, but but um, this experiment actually was uh, was worth the money, I must say. So we saw um, a beautiful representation of the many different cell types, and uh, first. Just, just characterized control with, uh, with the EAE. And uh, as you would expect, there's a huge increase, uh, in particular in, um, in here in green, you see the, the mild compartment. Um, and, and you do see, uh, uh, relatively speaking, also a huge increase of, of course, of lymphocytes here as well, as expected. And we look at uh, the, what populations uh, um, changed their gene expression pattern. It was also actually the myelid cells which had the strongest a dysregulation of, of genes, much more than the cells that are actually affected, which are oligodendrocytes and, and astrocytes to some degree. So um, can we, how can we explain the, um, the functional benefits, right? You would hope that there is more myelination going on, and that's exactly what we see. So when we, when we uh, stain and quantify the amount of myelin with this, um, with this myelin stain, um, I just show you some, uh, some uh, representative examples, but we have quantified this, and there is indeed um, increased myelination in the, in the treatment groups, both in the bone marrow and the um, bone marrow with the plexicon group. And when we look at um, specifically the gene expression in the oligodendrocyte uh, lineage, which is composed of you know, the, the entire path of an undifferentiated oligosome precursor cell all the way to a mature cell, I didn't quite appreciate the, the, the the heterogeneity of, of, of this lineage in, in, in the mouse's brain, um, we see actually that the uh, um, program that is induced by EAE, sort of the disease state, is rather reversed in the um, bone marrow treatment groups, both uh, conventional as well as uh, with plexicon. So I apologize for, for a little bit complicated way to, to show this data, but this is um, essentially a correlation between um, genes that are induced or repressed in, um, in the control versus EAE, which is plotted on this axis, and the genes that are then um, um, changed, if you want, in either the uh, bone marrow transmutation group versus uh, EAE or the bone marrow, uh, our modified version with, with, with the plexicon group. And as you can see, in both cases, there is a negative correlation in those genes, saying that you know, the genes that are induced um, by EAE are rather repressed in, in both treatment groups, and the genes that are downregulated in response to EAE are rather upregulated. In other words, these both treatment groups seem to rather normalize the gene expression pattern of the oligodendrocyte cells, um, which is, of course, nice and consistent with, with a um, better myelination and can explain uh, why and overall there's a healthier you know, brain and a healthier mouse. So the exact same thing was true for astrocytes. Um, again, um, 
remarkably heterogeneous population in our brains. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, a lot of people think about the heterogeneity of, of glial cells in the, in the brain now. And again, when we do the same type of analysis, uh, we see rather a more normalization of the uh, gene expression uh, um, pattern in the astrocytes specifically. However, when we look now at the myelid cells specifically, which I, I told you has actually the largest changes overall, um, and also are very, very heterogeneous, um, we actually see the exact opposite. So in contrast to the other glial populations, the sort of um, microglial response to EAE, which is again is plotted here right, on, on, the, on the left, on the, on the, on the y-axis, is rather enhanced in our treatment groups, which uh, I want to remind you are of course clinically better. So the microglial response due to EAE is not normalized or going to a normal microglial state in, in, these, in these treatment groups. It rather makes the microglial reactive state more pronounced, right? So it's, it's a stronger uh, reaction, so to say, that we see in this, in this microglial, which is, I think, highly suggestive of um, the conclusion that this particular state, this particular microglial response or reaction to the disease is actually beneficial because when we enhance this program, we see a better clinical effect. And we have a functional um, perturbation here because that is exactly the, the cells that we have boosted right, through our, through our tr transmutation approach. All right, that's all I wanted to share with you today. Um, this is a, a picture of the lab and you can see it's full of happy people. I, I will point out that maybe it was a little cheating um, the fact that really everybody smiles so well might be due because my 12-year-old boy took this picture. So it probably was a very funny um, thing to look at. <laughs> um, I should also briefly mention the names. I think I mentioned Yohei uh, Shibuya, who has now uh, recently left the lab, who he really brought the microglial um, project into the lab. Uh, Yongjin was almost single-handedly responsible for this um, TRIM2 pro project and Marius Meda for the uh, EAE project. And the first part of my talk was um, um, really spearheaded by a former student, Jean, who is now a postdoc in Boston. Thank you so much. Well, that was really wonderful presentation, Marius. Thank you so much. Great basic research with profound clinical implications. And uh, we'll take some questions. So uh, let's take a couple from here, if there are any. And uh, please go to the microphone and uh, tell us what your question is. I see Sean going there. <laughs> Hi, that's great. Uh, I was wondering, in both the, the in induced neuronal cells and in your microglia from the bone marrow, when you profile those, do you, do you see ghosts of their past in the in the transcripts? Are there are there parts of their identity that haven't been converted, and and do they fall into sort of regulatory aspects that maybe are intractable to the to the inductions? Yes, excellent question. I I didn't go into this, but we looked um, early on at this very question very carefully. And uh, that was actually one of the reasons why for that purpose we, we used a more defined donor cell type. We used hepatocytes rather than fibroblasts, which are not really well defined, you know. Um, but hepatocytes, you know, pr pretty clear what it is. And looked very specifically at uh, remnants of hepatocyte genes. And uh, we did see more expression of sort of a hepatocyte signature than you would expect, but it was rather well repressed, I must say. It, and we, you know, we, we didn't drag it out too long, um, so it, it 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 goes down over time. Um, and I would assume, you know, the longer you wait, the less the less you have. But it was was not very prominent. Um, in that context, what other this is other people's work. Um, what seems to be conserved, though, is what people call it some sort of aging signature. So when you take a fibroblast from an old person and uh, reprogram that to IPS cells, and then turn these cells into neurons. 
much of the sort of cell biological markers and signatures and transcriptional signatures of aging is, is, has disappeared. So it seems when you go through an iPS cell reprogramming step, you actually rejuvenate the cells. And from our mouse work, we can also confirm because you know these iPS cells they make they make mouse babies, right? And they, they look very young, even when we take them from adult tail tip fibroblasters, so, right? So there is a sort of a cellular rejuvenation process going on in iPS cells. Uh, it seems seems quite plausible. However, when you directly uh, convert somatic cells uh, into neurons with with our transcription factor methods, not going through iPS cells, then these features seem to be maintained. Other questions? Was, was that your question? Uh, <coughs> other you questions? You asked about the micro. Micro is a little different because um, th these cells actually are not, they're not identical, as I briefly alluded to. Tr from a transcriptional point of view and a morphological point of view and some functional pr uh, pr properties, they're, they're, they're distinct. They're, they're myelid cells, there are sort of other types of tissue resident macrophages, not exactly microglia, but you know something very similar, but but distinct. Other questions from this audience? Uh, May, do we have any questions online? She's a question, though. Okay. So thank thank you for the talk. So I was just wondering, um, uh, you know, when I read the papers that you've presented here, I was quite excited because we were working on some neurodegenerative phenotype, but. Uh, also, the fact that the the CSF1R inhibitor that you used is actually FDA approved for something else. It is. Something else, it is. Right? I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Yes, and so uh, would it be possible to think about like inhibiting other cells in the brain, and would you expect the same, um, I guess, competitive advantage of uh, bone marrow cells? Uh, you mean uh, other cells? Yes. Like replacing oligonucleotides with the same trick? Right. Huh. Interesting thought. Um, Potentially, we, um, we probably picked the um, sort of the lowest hanging fruit or the easiest population because microglia are known to repopulate re really rapid rapidly. I'm not sure it's known in the human brain, but in mouse brain, literally in, in days uh, from a completely depleted microglia brain, you, you have a fully repopulated brain. And what we think is happening is that the transplanted cells and the endogenous remaining mi microglia are in a competitive situation in this repopulation assay or in this uh, repopulation um, situation. And the transplanted cells, they win the race. And that's why the entire brain is full of uh, these, these grafted cells. So that is a little harder to recapitulate with cells that are much slower, with a much slower turnover. But in principle, the same trick could work too. Yeah, good point. So apparently we need microglia to feed and interact some of the neurons in the brain. Is that interaction more for some types of neurons than for others? Or do all the neurons in the brain need microglia to the same extent? That is a great question. That is a great question. And I don't know the answer to this. Um, I was shocked to learn that uh, short-term effects of microdepletion don't have much of an effect, actually. So when you deplete microglia with this drug, for example, and then do behavioral analysis, um, people cannot really find differences. We know from human genetics in particular that long-term damage to microglia, genetic damage, right, like term two, causes problems mm -hmm. of over decades. What these microglia do to nurture, you know, the environment in this chronic uh, phase is, I think, a very exciting <coughs> field of study that I would encourage everybody to work on. <laughs> yeah, I can sort of imagine if you do enough bone marrow transplants, which is essentially microglial replacement with different human diseases, we may find that out you know, True. eventually. Yeah. Yeah, 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 good point. Donna? Yeah, I recently learned something interesting that I wondered how it plays into some of your work, and that is that um, microglia, uh, cupper cells, um, some other uh, cells are um, actually uh, embryologically derived from the yolk sac That's correct. rather than uh, the bone marrow. And so, and as such, 
you know, they are under perhaps genetic, dif different transcriptional programming. And it, it's only, so they are derived from the yolk sac, go to the liver, and then from there uh, will populate, uh, you know, where the brain microglia will be, and also in the liver where copper cells will be, and dendritic cells in the skin, for instance. And then only later, so I don't know how long after embryonically, what embryonic day later, you've eventually um, developed uh, a bone marrow, and then you begin to uh, create some of those cells that are hematopoietic stem cells that will ultimately go to some of these same places and differentiate into those same types of cells, but they're, they're, they're they're coming from different populations, and, and as such, they're, they're, they interact. We know that they interact, but they're different, uh, and perhaps under different transcriptional programs. And I wonder, as you were talking about um, the microglia that were, that once you did the, the, um, the transplant, that they weren't, um, you weren't having as many chimera right, in the brain, in microglia. I wonder if that's because um, it's not normal for those cells to be coming so much from the bone marrow. Rather, they're, they're established there from this prior population in the yolk sac. Is that yeah. something that's important? Yeah. yeah. Uh, everything you said is 100% correct, as far as I know, <laughs> um, at least in mice. Uh, there is some intriguing circumstantial evidence that perhaps in the human brain the situation is very different. Um, and even there is some, some reports in mice that are not properly lineage traced, unfortunately, uh, or transplantation based with, with you know, things like irradiation and so forth, so they are quite perturbed. Um, but there might be a bit more influx from peripheral cells into the brain that we think um, at the moment. Because just, uh, you know, the, the studies on the York sector, it is all true, it's, it's very well characterized in mice, and there's, in the normal conditions, uh, you know, not, not, not convincing evidence that in mice, uh, physiologically, cells would go from the circulation into the brain. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and, and we actually thought, since it's not, it's not, it's not uh, published, we have to bite the bullet and uh, do a proper lineage a tracing experiment and wait for two years until the mouse gets old and see whether maybe in, in, in aged mice there is maybe more influx from, uh, from the periphery to the, to the brain, which may also be sort of regulated by aging or causing aging or something like that. So May, is there one last question from online? Yeah, so from Yvonne, actually. So um, wonderful talk. Would overexpression of TREM2 have similar effect on the clearance of a beta amyloid in the, in the brain? Sorry, the TREM2 overexpression has beta? Overexpression of TREM2. Yeah. Would it have an, uh, the same effect on the clearance of amyloid in the brain? Oh, rather than using uh, like white type levels trying to overexpress TREM2? Uh, it's hard to know. I think there's one study uh, out there that, that tried that, with a supercharged uh, TREM2, and um, they used a humanized um, um, model, and it, it's, it's, that paper claimed that uh, overactivating the pathway could, could be beneficial, even in a, like a TREM2 white type situation. Right? So in a normal you know, population, when you just increase TREM2 function, that could have a, a therapeutic effect. But it's not our work. All right, this was spectacular. Thank you so much, and I uh, really appreciate your coming here and also talking to all of us individually. So uh, we really appreciate that. Nice work. Thank you.